So uh, with that, I'm going to now introduce you to Professor John Gee. And um, I want to read his bio. I don't think very many people read his bio, probably because they can't. It's, uh, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not one that's going to be able to read this, so I'll just have to ask you to uh, bear with me on, some, on pronouncing some of these. But, but it's, really, um, it's really such a great privilege to be, uh, to be able to go on this tour with John Gee, to be able to learn from him. And this will give you an idea of why that is. John Gee is the William Bill Gay Research Professor in the Department of Asian and Near Eastern Languages at Brigham Young University. He has authored more than 150 publications on topics such as ancient scripture, Aramaic, archaeology, Coptic, Egyptian, history, linguistics, Luwian, rhetoric, Sumerian textual criticism, and published in journals such as the British Museum Studies in Ancient Egypt and Sudan, Bulletin of the Egyptological Seminar, Encoria, Enzyme, Farms Review, Gottinger Mizellen, Issues in Religion and Psychotherapy, Journal of Academic Perspectives, Journal of the American Research Center in Egypt, Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, Journal of Egyptian History, Journal of the Society for the Study of Egyptian Antiquities, Lingua Egyptica, Review of Books in the Book of Mormon, Studien Zur Alta Egyptian Kultur, Interpreter, and by such presses as American University of Cairo Press, Archaeo Press, Association Egyptologique Rhine Elizabeth, E.J. Brill, Karsten Nybor Institute of Near Eastern Studies, Czech Institute of Egyptology, Deseret Book, De Gruter Hasserwitz, Institut Francais de Archaeologique Orientale, Macmillan, Oxford University Press, Peters, Prager, Religious Studies Center, and Society of Biblical Literature. He has published three books and edited eight books and an international multilingual peer-reviewed professional journal and has twice served as the section chair for the Society of Biblical Literature. And with that, I'll turn the time over to John Gee. Um, it's good to be with you tonight. I'm grateful to all of you for coming and some of you from a long way. Uh, I hope I'll make this worth your while. Um, somewhat generic topic here, the Gospel and the Egyptians. Um, we have two scriptures that, okay. Okay, we have two scriptures that are controlling our understanding here. And the first one is this, is this one in Alma. Behold, the Lord doth grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue to teach his word, yea, in wisdom, all that he seeth fit that they should have. So among all those nations is Egypt. And so we want to see what they, uh, what portion of his word uh, that they were able to teach their, in their own nation and tongue. Uh, Pharaoh, being a righteous man, established his kingdom and judged his people wisely and justly all his days seeking earnestly to imitate that order established by the fathers in the first generation. So it's an imitation. They don't have necessarily the full thing. They don't necessarily have it right. But let's see what they've got. Um, and so if we're looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way it's defined by Jesus Christ, in 3 Nephi 27, we're not going to see all of that there, but we'll see what we can, what they actually have. And I'm going to start with, okay, now it didn't work. Okay. All right, I'm going to start, this is the only picture of something that we're not visiting in, in my presentation. Most of the rest of the illustrations will be from stuff that potentially we can see. Um, or at least we'll be at the right place. This is from Theban tomb 89. Now this, this looks a mess. This is a central pillar from the tomb and there's some graffiti over it. Um, and you can see 
that the tomb owner here has been hacked out. So, uh, but what interests me, besides the scene here, is the graffito that is written there. So I've transcribed it here and put a translation at the, the bottom. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and the Twelve Apostles, uh, I don't know, come to us maybe. Um, and then it's, so that's that little bit up top. And then it's Jesus Christ have mercy on us. And then it says, uh, grant the end of all of these things. I did not see any of them in the work, in all of the works, um, which uh, God wanted on his hand. Sorry, I ran out of room. Uh, so it's actually referring to the scene that it's writing on. And this is written by a Coptic monk who was in there and didn't like what he saw and wants to be saved from the images on the wall. And this, there's a, a tension between the Coptic Christians, so these are Egyptian, these are Egyptians who became Christians and then passed it down, and the earlier Pharaonic religion. And so what we have is a situation where Coptic Christians demonized the Pharaonic Egypt. And so, and you can see this in what they do with the vocabulary. So if you remember the picture that's hacked out, that's a picture of a beatified spirit or an angel. And the term for that is ich. And the Coptic takes that term ich and refers it to demons. So they wanted to be protected from the demons on the walls. Uh, then you have Imenti, the West. And if you look at these necropoli, they're almost always on the west bank of Egypt. The west is where the Ahu live. And so Amente in Coptic is the word for hell. Because demons live in hell. And apparently so did some of the monks. Because uh, they used to live in the tombs. Uh, Heka is the term for supernatural power and this becomes Coptic heek magic. So the power by which the earlier Egyptian religion worked was now considered magic. Uh, Pecker to heal becomes foher to charm or bewitch. You don't really heal them, they're just bewitching you. And uh, Jed Medu say the words which is, shows up on all these ritual incantations. And it's the beginning of a ritual becomes gem tau, to utter magic. So there's this demonization process where the Christian cops viewed the earlier Pharaonic religion as demonic. Except it doesn't always work. So what happens when Coptic Christians borrow temple terminology from the Egyptians. Because some of the words that were used by in the Egyptian religion in the temples, they thought were close enough to what they were doing that they actually borrowed them into Christianity. So what about those terms? Uh, so it's got to have been close enough to the Christian concept that they say, yeah, we'll just use this term. And the prime example of that is the word nuta, God. That was close enough that they didn't demonize it, they borrowed it. And that is the standard word for, for God and still used in the Christian liturgy today. And, but then we can take this and to turn it on its head. So there are these 
Christian usages of these earlier Egyptian terms, and they show up in the temples. What if, and they were obviously close enough to what the Christians believed that they thought they could use the term safely. And what if we then take those Christian terms and apply them back into the temple text and read them? Because most of the time, Egyptologists have their preferred, certain preferred translation and, that, and they try to say, well, the earlier Egyptians are not Christians and therefore we want to exclude the Christian meanings. But what if we adopt them? So I, what I'm doing is a little bit ortho, unorthodox from an Egyptological perspective, but hopefully will be insightful from a Latter-day Saint perspective. So we're going to start here. Okay, this is also something we're not going to see be in, in Egypt because this is in Scotland. Um, but this is, this is an interesting text because you have the top half of the text is written in Heretic. And the bottom half is written in Demotic. It's the same text. And so they're actually translating between the two texts. And so in the Demotic text, they use the word Weshed, which goes into Coptic as Wosh. This is the term to worship. This is what Coptic Christians do. But they're trans using it here to translate um, what in the, the archaic phrase that's in the Heretic, Moneter, which means to see God. So worship is part of seeing God, or seeing God is part of worship. Um, so that's interesting. And then later on that same papyrus, the demotic term again uses worship, but the term that it's translating is to kiss the ground. So that's also part of <coughs> worship. And you can see a Muslim reflection of this. In Islam, five times a day they pray and they touch their forehead to the ground. And that's part of their worship. Now these two terms, to see God and kissing the ground, are actually rituals that you will find on some of the temples that we're going to go to. And we're going to start here looking, <coughs> we'll spend a lot of time at this one. This is the Edfu Temple. Um, and this is what it looks like as you approach it. And so we're going to show you some things that you can see in the temple. And help you recognize things here that when you're there, you can, you'll recognize them and say, oh, I know what this is. At least that's the hope, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to read the temple. We're going to look at the architecture here. Uh, so you have the big pylon that we saw in the previous slide. That's this thing here. Behind that, you have this courtyard. And um, outside the temple is the chaotic world. It's chaos, and then this, the temple is a place to organize the world. And you come into this peristyle hall. So there are all these pillars around the edge of the courtyard. This is open to the air. And then this becomes a separate building in the temple. This courtyard is, um, is where the public is, was allowed. And so one of the things when you're visiting these temples is you're doing something that most ancient Egyptians, as far as we know, couldn't do because you're going to be inside. Uh, so this one is where the public could go and then you were limited to certain people here. This is a hypostyle hall, so all of this is roofed. And this is open to the sun, but this is 
And this has some high windows that you can see through. And you have the hy this hypostyle hall, you have a second hypostyle hall, and this represents uh, a garden or a thicket. Um, and it, it's a specific type of garden. It's the one that goes back to the beginning of the creation. So that's here. There are rooms off to the side. This one is where they did some washings of people. This one deals with anointing. It's the next one over here. And then over here you get amulets to put on your clothing. And so this, um, that provides the amulets. Then you come in here, this is the Hall of Offerings. And then this is the place of the gods up here. And so you have the central shrine, and then all around it, you have different shrines, each dedicated to a different member of the council of the gods that assembles in that temple. And they have reference to these, these various gods, and different temples have different councils of gods that are associated with it. Um, well, I know there are questions already. Um, maybe we can pass them the microphone and take one or two now. We have some more to, to go, but we're, uh, actually it's in the back first. Gentlemen in the back. These, what year were these temples built? Oh, great question. So we're gonna be looking at a couple of different temples. Edfu, took about 150 years to build. Uh, it starts at about, oh, about 300, well, a little after 300 BC and was finished at about 100 BC. Okay, so those are, those are rough estimates, but so this is, in, in time period wise, this is a Ptolemaic period. We will jump to another temple, which is a thousand years earlier and in the course of this, but we'll talk mainly about this time. And if you want to, the last lecture, John Thompson dealt with the pyramid texts, which are about 2,000 years before this temple. So would both male and female be able to attend this temple, or was it, did you have to be like a priest, or? Uh, that's a really good question. And so what we do know is that Priests are allowed in. They do have female priests that belong to certain temples. Um, we know less about them and how they fit in. Uh, and um, I can't, so I, I, when I'm working on priests, I'm working in Thebes. And so each place has its own. And so if you get over to Thebes, which is uh, north of Edfu, and we'll talk about Thebes later. Uh, that's where I know, we can tell you about what priests are and what they do. They have a different names of those in Edfu, and I'm not up on those right now. So I, I'm sorry, that doesn't particularly answer your question, but that's the best I can do right now. Um, so as we look at, at Edfu, and we were talking about worship, we're going to look at the worship that takes place at Edfu. And so it starts with this ritual of leaving the palace. And usually they show this with the king. Sometimes they show priests, but most of the time it's the, the king. So this is a priest. This is the king. This is the representation of the palace. He's leading it. Um, this is from one of the publications. Uh, this is a picture, this is also not the same scene, but this one is also at Edfu, where you, again, you have the king. This time he's headed this way. There's the palace. And this, you have a priest, this time he's facing the king. But uh, this one uh, is one that you can see in Edfu. These scenes are often found in multiple places. So here is another one. You can see this is right on the edge of the wall. And here is the king leaving the palace uh, with the priest in, in front of him. This is 
one of the rituals. So that's the first step. You have to leave the home. The next step is washing clothing. So this is the washing scene, and this is clothing, including putting on, in this case, a crown. And again, you can see these all over, but here, John, yeah. You mentioned what the symbols represent that they're being washed with. Okay, we can get, we can get to that. We're, I was going to do that a little later. Um, so you have these two vases here. You have this symbol, which is on its side. You can see it a little better here. This is called an Ankh symbol. And the Egyptian word Ankh means life. And the other one here is a wasp scepter. And that's usually thought to mean dominion. In fact, if one of the classic articles on this scene is called the baptism of Pharaoh. Um, one of the things that they mention here is this is to make the king wab which Egyptologists translate as pure. Uh, Copts also add the sense of holy because Pepnel Mat Wab is the Holy Spirit. So, so here's another example and here's that sign for Wab here and here. And these rituals here, uh, Brigitte Altenmuller casting showed that they go back at, at least 2,000 years at this point. So you can find them in the pyramid text way back in the fifth dynasty, 2,000 years before these scenes were carved on. They're still using the same basic ritual there. And because you might want to know some of the inscriptions, this is an example. Uh, it says, my beloved son is doubly pure. My heart is precise because of your majesty's purity. And here's another one at Edfu. Uh, they are all over the place if you learn to spot them. So you, know, you can see the pile on the background, but here's that washing scene down at the bottom. Is that a declaration of, him, of the Pharaoh being the coming son of God? Um, the Pharaoh is seen as the son of God. He proclaims himself that in almost all of his titles. Um, and they often talk about him being literally the son of God. Uh, he's, and a specific one at that. Usually it's the sun god Ray. And so you have that, uh, when that actually takes place, I don't know if any Egyptologists have actually looked at it that way. They just assume this is, this is the way it is. Is there a point where he becomes the, the son of God? Um, that's a good question, and I don't know that anyone's ever thought to ask I'm that. I'm just thinking of Psalm 2. There's no way you're in Yeah, there, there's that example in Psalm 2 where, um, and that's applied to the Israelite king. Um, there's the point, they've often, some people think that Jesus was declared, the, well, he was declared the Son of God at his baptism, uh, and some people think that he wasn't that before that, but that's, I, I won't go split those theological hairs. Uh, but it's a good question, uh, but as I say, I don't think anyone's ever thought to ask that. Um, and as I kind of go through the, the material, I don't know if we can answer that question. If we go to, Dar we, we will at least drive by Daryl Bakri. Um, Daryl Bakri is a big temple of Hatshepsut and she actually has scenes on her temple where she, where they depict her divine conception. So for her, it goes all the way back to the womb. Uh, is that general? Is that specific? That's a, a question you can ask, but I can't answer right now. Another place that we're, these are all Edfu. Another place that we're visiting is Komombo. And you can see uh, there's another one of these purification scenes at Komombo. Uh, and this one here where everyone wanted to get their take the picture, you can see that's 
larger than life size. And here is yet another one at Komombo. So you'll see these scenes in many of the temples that we'll visit. And when you see it, you'll know what it is. And along with that, and usually right next to it, you have the clothing or crowning scene. You can see that uh, later people have come and hacked off all of the, all of the demons images here. Um, and one of the things that you'll see in Egypt is that all of these years of civilization are just sandwiched next to each other. And you can see various historical processes. This is probably Christian. Um, this is another one at Edfu. Uh, and yet another one. Some of these are a little hard to see, the light. Um, the light isn't always the best for pictures, but here's the king and them putting his crown on. Um, as I say, you will find these scenes together throughout the Yes, yeah, sure. Were they painted at one time? Were, were, they, were they painted, were they painted at one time? Because now we're seeing them as, you know, all monochromatic. There are places where you can see traces of paint. If you want to see if they were painted, look up at the sockles. So when you go underneath the roof, look up at the roof and see if you can see traces of paint. Um, you will also see traces of smoke, but what you won't get are things like um, bat guano on the ceiling. It just, gravity doesn't tend to let it stay up there. If you go to places like Medina Tabu, they do have the, the paint still on the walls and that's 3,000 years old. Uh, I don't think Medina Tabu is on our itinerary, so I didn't include um, pictures there. But there you are can the colors see it from are still the, bright. From a but, hot air balloon. Yeah, but you can't see the the, <laughs> the painting on the wall. So um, I'm trying to work with what your things that you can you can actually see when you know when you get there and you know what to look for. So this is at Komombo. The the baptism scene is right over here, and here's the putting the crown on. And we know from some of the inscriptions, some, I showed you some of the rooms where they would do this. Um, now, then you get this nice long scene here. And so for after the, the washing, the clothing, then you have the initiation. This is seeing God. This is kissing the ground. And this is praising God. And then this is fighting your enemies. And those are all put together, and they're part of what's called the royal ritual. Um, what was the last one? Smiting your enemies. That's a crocodile he's spearing. Is the reading from right to left? Uh, is the, the reading from the, right to is left? Is the reading from right to left? Well, if they're working on papyrus, it's always right to left. Well, most of the time, unless they're writing retrograde and trying to keep it secret, and in which case they write backwards. Um, on temple walls, uh, this, the writing here actually goes in both directions. Usually, the writing goes, so in this case, the writing that it pertains to this person will face this way, or well, I guess you'll, you read it this way, it's facing that way, and in this case, you'll read it this way into his, you, you go into the face of the person speaking it. And so they will actually switch directions. They will also arrange, um, they will arrange writing so that uh, some of the tombs as you go into them, the ones on the right hand wall will read into the tomb and the ones on the left-hand wall will read the other way, into the tomb. So the idea is that you read into the tomb, not necessarily right to left. They can write in either direction, and they will do it symmetrically. What about if the writing is going up and down? If the writing is going up and down, it's still read 
there's still a direction to the columns and it's still the same way. So in this case, for example, you'll read this column, this column, this column, the one up top, which is a horizontal row and then down the column. But, but do you start at the top and read down? Yes. Okay. They, they never go from the bottom and read up. That's, um, okay. Sometimes they do scenes that way, but they don't do hieroglyphs that way. <laughs> Uh, but that's a great question and it's one of the first things that you have to grapple with when you learn hieroglyphs is uh, which, which way do you go? Um, so this is how initiation scenes actually look when you get on the temple wall. Again, this is Ed Fu. Uh, so here you can see them initiating. This is the king and he's going this way. Um, Here's another one. Uh, you usually get God on either side and introduced into the presence of God. You will note some similarities with facsimile three. Um, in this case, uh, we've got a, one of the inscriptions, welcome my beloved son, I rejoice to see your face. Um, and the term welcome there means come in peace. And the word peace, hotep, is the word used in the Coptic New Testament for atonement or reconciliation. So there's another example of where you, that comes in. Then after the initiation, you have seeing God. Now, uh, they do some, in the, in the Ptolemaic temples, so the ones 300 BC to the time of Christ, uh, they normally just show the person standing. In the earlier New Kingdom ones, so the time of Moses, uh, they, they tend to actually show them doing things like kneeling uh, and showing some of the ritual actions. But this one, they just have them standing. So uh, in the ritual of seeing God here, it says, I have reached heaven, strongly ascending to the Holy of Holies, to glimpse God in his horizon forever. And if you remember those pylons on the outside of the temple, those are shaped, kind of squarish form, of the Egyptian sign for the horizon. The horizon is where heaven and earth meet, and the temple is the horizon where heaven and earth also meet. And in this case, you have this dialogue between the king and the god. The king says, I have been initiated to the mighty God whose image is secret. And the God says, I have placed your fear in everyone who sees you. So it has this, plays off this idea of seeing God. And the idea is that the Pharaoh is now the son of God. And so everyone who sees him will have the same sort of fear that they would have towards a God. This one is, so this ritual is followed by kissing the ground. And if this were New Kingdom, you'd actually see them kissing the ground, but they're not showing that in Ptolemaic period. So it's the kissing the ground of the Holy of Holies. And the king says, I have instructed the prophets of, this, of the great and powerful God who enter his shrine to kiss the ground. And the God says back, I have caused the foreigners to come bowing on the earth, kissing the ground for you. So there's this reciprocity, and the king it becomes an image of the god and is able to um, have the same thing done to him as he does to God. Uh, and finally, the praising God, Hail, Ray, Lord of heaven, I have pleased you perfectly. And the god says, I have caused this land to praise you. So... Again, that mirror image form. So I'm going to show you one other thing that you'll see all over the place. And there's this phrase that's um, deonk, to give life. And it's hard to see here, but you have that onk sign here. And the god here gives it to the king, and he actually places it to his nose and points at his nose, and uh, uh, the word onk means life, and he's giving life to him. But this phrase, give life, goes into Coptic as tanho, to save. 
And so this is the God saving the king. And they will actually show him giving the life sign. And uh, when I teach my beginning hieroglyph students, if we come to the line, I give li life to your nose. Uh, when they first run across it, they don't know what that means. But if you see the iconography, you can see exactly why they would say that. And this shows up all over the place. So I'm going to, here you have a scene on a pillar where the goddess is giving life to the nose of the king. She's saving him. We're, that was Edfu. We're going to drop to Karnak. You'll also see Karnak. These are from the Hypostyle Hall. And these are a little bit clearer. Um, here, so here's the scene. And this is an initiation scene, as you recognize, with the two gods on either side of the king. And in the blow up, here's the Ankh sign that he's giving to his nose. And here is the phrase, and you can spot this here. So there's the Ankh sign, and this reads D, meaning to give. And so this is giving life, and it's put after the name of the king. And here they show him giving life to the king. Uh, other places where this shows up. So in that scene up here, it again says he gives life to the king. The, D, the sign is written a little differently. That triangular loaf is shrunk down and put into the hand. So they're actually giving something. And here, this god is holding the life sign so that he can give it to the king. And that's a little bit clearer here uh, in the two scenes, one with the, the Ankh sign being held in the hand. And here he gives life, and there's that other dominion scepter that, they, that showed up in the baptism. Yes, in the baptism. So all of these images you're showing are they're, they're Coptic, which means that they're Greek in origin? Uh, well, okay, this script is Coptic. It's Egyptian language written in Greek characters, except that one second to the right doesn't show up in Greek. It's borrowed from Egyptian. There are six of those. All these were done after Christ. Well, uh, the Coptic ones are, but this one is the time of Moses. So I'm showing you scenes so most of these temples were built before the time of Christ. There are a few that are built after. Uh, we won't visit it, but when we get to Esna and to go through the locks, there's a temple of Esna, and that's actually after Christ. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think that's on the tour. Um, it's just too long to unload the boat and load back in. So, but I'm going to show you some of the, the details, and so. Hopefully these will give you some things to look for when you're in the temple and you can say, ah, I know what that is. This is life and he's going to give it to the king. And in some of these cases you get the inscription mirrors the picture. So here there's that give sign. I have given to you life and dominion. There's the life he's giving, and there's the dominion scepter he's holding in the other hand. So you have, so this is a, a scene from the daily temple liturgy that's on the wall of the Hypostyle Hall in Karnak. As you go into the Hypostyle Hall, you go all the way through the columns and off to the left, and that's where you'll find this one. So that's similar to the, that's similar to the Genesis depiction of God breathing into Adam. It is. And, and they talk about the breath of life. Um, and Mesopotamians, so in, in Egypt, you give life to the nose, you breathe into the nose and that, and you detect whether somebody's living by whether they're breathing through their nose. In Mesopotamia, man is created and they are making him out of clay and they're pounding the clay and that pounding generates the beating of the heart. And so Mesopotamia, you test whether somebody's alive 
by seeing if their heart's beating. Uh, two different cultural differences. The, uh, the Hebrew terms in Genesis follow the, uh, the Egyptian ones in that particular case. But there are some other things I want to show in this scene. Um, so another thing where the, this, he's holding a torch. He's giving a torch. And the word for torch is right there. So it doesn't always match. Here they spelled it out and they don't have one sign that they're, they're dealing with, but they're still referring to it in the picture. And this one is actually, text is actually somewhat poetic. This is the title of the text, establishing a torch. And this established term appears again and again, almost metrically. So 10 more times in the, in the composition, is, it says I'm going to establish this torch like so-and-so established this, and so-and-so established that. And that's repeated. This is what the king says when he performs this ritual. And you can see, in this case, he's actually kneeling down. Uh, this is uh, different there. But if you know what you're looking for, in this case, it's reduced to this sign. It's spelled out here, but it's reduced to this sign, and then it's repeated. So these are some things that if you look at it and you notice, oh, this sign tends to get repeated. That may be, give you some indication of what's going behind it. So we talked about the royal ritual in the Ptolemaic period. Here it is in the New Kingdom on the wall of the Hypostyle Hall in Karnak, leaving the palace. So this is a thousand years earlier. Same iconography. Here's the washing. Here's the initiation, and here's entering the presence of God. There's the God, there's the shrine around him, the king sitting in it, in the shrine, being crowned by the God himself. Uh, and so here they are leaving the palace, and do you recognize this now? So this says he'll save him, and... This one is, says he's saved. Here's the initiation. Do you recognize that? So again, this is, it's starting out as, as being saved. This is entering the presence of God. And here it is again, right after Pharaoh's name. And there you see it in his hand where the god is going to, is holding on to life and going to give it to the king. Yes? The king is kneeling. Is that, is that a compass on his shoulder? Oh, this here? Yes. He's holding a flail. What's a flail? Something you beat people with. Oh, a flail. <laughs> <laughs> So besides the royal ritual, they also have, and this is clearer in the New Kingdom temples, uh, the, uh, the daily temple liturgy. And so this, this will show you uh, how the elements of this ritual are organized. So. <coughs> You have the label here. You have the speech of the king here. You have the answer of the god here. Or maybe the god talks first. We don't really know. But. And so the glyphs around the god give the response. The glyphs around the king up, up above his head say what he's saying in the ritual. And there's a label right where they meet. Uh, it can be sometimes tricky to spot where the label is. Uh, it's easier if you know which way the glyphs read, but uh, because they'll switch directions. Part of the daily temple liturgy, they would light a, a they'd light this fire and then throw incense on it at the beginning. We have 
we have scrolls that detail this. And then they would walk back to the Holy of Holies, singing as they went. And then they, when they got to the Holy of Holies, they would break the seal, draw back the bolt, so the se- they'd tie it up and then put this lump of mud on it and stamp it to seal it shut. Um, we use similar technology, only with lead, on our gas meters. Um, but it's the idea is nobody's tampered with it. And then finally they'd open the door, and then they see God, and the first thing they do is fall down on their, their face and beg to God not to strike them dead as they're entering the presence of God. Uh, so this is uh, the one on the Karnak Hype Style Hall. And so that gives you an idea of some of the rituals. And they would do this every day in the temple. And we have, they changed some things, but we have, have records of this that stretch over a thousand years. And I found references to this ritual a thousand years before that. So this is, is something that they did a lot. I'm going to take you back to Edfu for one final thing, and that is this is called the Hall of Offerings or the Hall of Atonement. So before you enter into the presence of God, you have to go through an atonement. And the washing, anointing, and amulets are preparatory to that atonement. And that's the way the temple is set up, at least in Greco-Roman times. Uh, a little different pattern in the New Kingdom temples. The ones that we'll visit are labyrinthinely complex. Uh, so you won't, this, but Edfu is nice that way. And so that shows at least some knowledge of an atonement that was needed uh, in the Egyptian sphere, and that is probably central to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, and so I want to let you think about how that uh, might apply or might make some of these things that we're going to visit more meaningful to you. And I'm very grateful to you all for coming again. We'll have some time, I think, for some questions. Okay, you're talking about these as being rituals that they go through every day. Is well, no, they're, they're, they're different types of rituals. So the, the royal ritual is something that they do at least once in their life, but they don't do all the time. The daily temple liturgy is something that they do every day. You can think of this as, as like there are rituals like baptism that we do once in our life, and then there are rituals like the sacrament, which we do every week. So they have both of those type of rituals. And I, I just, I'm sorry if I didn't make that as clear as I need to. Most of the time we were talking about the royal ritual, which we don't know if that's done more than once, but it's not done all the time whereas the daily temple liturgy is done all the time. Both of them involve seeing God, and that's the thing that ties the two together. So you could compare that to what, sort of like what we're doing in the temple today. There are people going all the time, and so they're doing, going through this particular ritual. There are some people who are doing that, but apparently the king probably only did it once, or? We have initiation records of priests in Karnak in the third intermediate period, so around the time of Isaiah. And they're doing it once, and they're recording that they were initiated, and what date, and some of their reactions. So they talk about the ho- entering the Holy of Holies is like entering into heaven. So that's actually a, ter- a phrase that shows up in these initiation records. So what we're seeing is a representation in the temple of probably whichever king it is who has gone through this ritual. Right, and it's usually thought that the king, that the priests go through more than the king, 
but and in some cases we know that the king never visited that particular temple but he's shown on the walls uh, so at, it's a representation and as a representation there are things that we can learn from it I hope I've shown you some things that you can look for when when you go to these and you can recognize them um, I didn't I probably could, should have uh, taken you through an offering scene. There are lots and lots of, most of the scenes are offering scenes. And they're read in a particular way. And so with early Egyptian Christianity, which we'll cover some of that with right. the cop, cops yeah. and so forth, are, I don't know where, where in Griggs Dig they had the, the uh, was it in, is it Celia? Celia is the pyramid. Fogelgamus is the cemetery. There you go, thank you. Uh, I'm, so Kerry Mulestein runs that particular dig. He's now the director. He took over from Wilfred Griggs. I'm the epigrapher, so um, I try to read the chicken scratch or stick figures that they come up with. Um, and we have another epigrapher who does Greek inscriptions. And so the, the cemetery there, the latest that we've got on it is it runs uh, from about 300 BC to about 700 AD. And this mm. is at Fogelgamus. They, anywhere you dig, you find a body. Mm. Um, or it seems like that. Maybe they're just lucky in where they, and so we have no idea. We know that they, the, the excavators have dug up a number of mummies uh, and we're trying to analyze them. And, and they just, they found them anywhere they looked. Is the clothing that we found on some of those corpses, is it there in Egypt or is it here? Or where, where is that? Uh, most of the clothes, well, some, most of the th items found on digs are uh, anything found, uh, done after 1970 is supposed to remain in the country that originated it. There are certain exceptions granted for study of materials. Um, I don't know all the details on that, but most of our material is located in magazines either at Falkel Gamus or at uh, Komashim. And so we have to go over to Egypt to study it. Um, and that's, that's an international law across the board. Um, and there are interesting legal and tech, technical uh, or and ethical um, disputed areas uh, but that's the general thing general law that people are operating on so when you go over to Egypt unless you want to spend 20 years in an Egyptian jail don't buy any real antiquities and um, you can buy reproductions uh, they have them available and that's up to you, but don't buy anything genuine. Don't take it out of the country. But what I was interested in is will the tour cover the, uh, no, the no. robing and the underclothing and so forth of some of the early Christian corpses? Um, yeah, there, there are, I'm going to defer to my colleagues. I have a whole bunch of colleagues on the dig who specialize in the textiles. Um, and I, I try to understand what's going on with them, but a lot of the details that they deal with are really technical. Um, I can kind of just remember what a, the difference between an S and a Z weave are. Uh, they've got that down. Um, and so if you're asking about those particular ones and which, when they date to and, and everything, then I'm going to defer you to for the latest material to the people who actually work that because um, the dating of a number of, of, of finds has been 
in flux. So as they've studied it, sometimes they've moved the date more recent, sometimes they've pushed it back, and sometimes both have happened. And so um, since they're intensively studying that material, it's not really fair for me to, <coughs> to chime in about something that they know so much more about. Okay, please join me in thanking Professor John Gee.